And we are joined now by Adrian Buller, uh, senior fellow at Commonwealth, author of The Value of a Whale on the Illusions of Green Capitalism. Adrian, thanks so much for coming on today. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. For sure. So um, I like to start with the title uh, often, but in your in the case of your book, um, I found the your talk about like the beauty of of whales and how you love them so much growing up um, to be a really moving way to kind of introduce people to the fool's gold that is green capitalism. Um, let's let's start there. Uh, uh, why you chose to, to title your book after this animal that you love so much growing up in Canada. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, as you said there, I grew up, I um, was lucky enough to grow up in the West Coast of British Columbia. So I have the very kind of fortunate position of being kind of like embedded in nature in quite a profound way sort of from, from the jump. Um, and the title of the book comes from a 2019 study published by a team at the International Monetary Fund um, that came from, I think, kind of an interesting premise about, you know, how can we think about the relationship between sort of nature conservation and, and the climate crisis and how can we get the private sector to help fund those, those kind of challenges. Um, and they tried to arrive at the kind of dollar value for a whale, so for an individual whale, uh, and arrived at the kind of tidy sum of about two million US dollars per whale, about a trillion for the global stock. Um, and that's kind of based on various things like their role in sequestering carbon, but also things like ecotourism, so like whale watching tours, mm. um, and then arrived at that figure. And for me, it was kind of this very kind of striking and almost perfect in a way distillation of the kind of often quite obscene kind of logics that that underlie a lot of what I talk about in the rest of the book about kind of green capitalism as a as a framework. Yeah, I mean it, it, it <laughs> we're assigning monetary value to nature and to animals, but I mean it's really just an extension of neoliberal policy assigning monetary value to human labor. I mean, we spoke about this earlier in the in the week, but the the myth of um, labor as capital, as opposed to capital being capital, um, <laughs> it, it, it over over inflates uh, the value of, of one's labor as a way to like kind of flatten the power dynamics under capitalism. And it it really says something that that is the lens in which so many NGOs and larger groups in this space are choosing to tackle the climate crisis. Yeah, I mean, I think the default approach, right, because we live under capitalism is that, you know, the only way to address any of the big challenges we face is, is through the sort of vehicle of the market. And if that is the assumption that you take, at first hand, then, you know, the only way that the market can engage is through is through prices, right? Anything that doesn't have a price is, you know, external to the market and therefore can't be engaged with uh, within it. And so, you know, that is the, you know, the approach that informs everything from valuing whales and the way that I think a lot of governments and sort of NGOs, international organizations are thinking about biodiversity, but, you know, also in the much more familiar form and, you know, carbon pricing, something that's been, you know, or that was before the kind of Inflation Reduction Act was kind of like the big debate in prospective American climate policy. Um, and yeah, I think that kind of logic necessarily seeps into sort of every approach to climate and ecological crisis if your starting assumption is that this has to be resolved through sort of market mechanisms. Well, that that is an underlying assumption for a majority of of, if not all of people in power, um, <laughs> with uh, some limited exceptions, but l let's let's rewind a little bit to when capitalists, power players, began to understand that this is how they could move forward with climate policy. Because I I, I grew up in um, an era when there were climate denial was widely accepted by a lot of people, and and. Um, we, we've come a long way in, 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 a, in, a, in a sense, but um, the solutions that have been coalesced uh, behind, as you say, are less than ideal. Yeah, I mean, yeah, in that sense, sort of green capitalism, as I engage with it, this idea of, you know, market actors seeking to not only engage with, but sort of advance climate policy and the climate agenda. In some ways, you can understand it, as you said, as, you know, 
a mark of some degree of progress, right? So we've moved from the kind of overt denial into a space where, you know, while it absolutely still happens, it's, you know, relatively at the fringes and, you know, to be a credible player, big financial firms, big corporates feel that at least rhetorically, you know, they need to have a position on climate, they need to be seen to be engaging on these issues. Um, and I think, you know, that is a marker of some degree of progress, but exactly as you said, you know, there has been a very clear result from that, which is that, you know, this advance is being led in many ways by and shaped by sort of the interests of large corporates and, and large financial firms, particularly, you know, the asset management industry, which I'm sure we'll come to and which is a big focus of the book. Um, and I think that's a real problem from, you know, not only the questions of kind of justice and sort of sort of democratic planning and input through this process of decarbonizing, but also just from sort of very basic hurdles of actually curbing emissions. And we can unpack that a bit, but I think a lot of the time the kind of market-led solutions are focused on kind of efficiency, on where profits can be made, on where risks can be minimized for sort of private sector actors and the outcomes of cutting emissions or sort of halting biodiversity loss. Those kinds of things are almost like secondary to those sort of first set of imperatives. Well, let, let's go there then uh, now. What are some of the hallmarks of those imperatives as imagined by market forces, NGOs, banks, et cetera? Yeah, the way that I simplify it is like there are two, the climate crisis, biodiversity crisis, those represent, I guess, like two things to the private sector, one of which is a kind of unprecedented threat. So in many ways, you know, the climate crisis represents uh, you know, a genuine threat to capitalism's ability to like reproduce itself. Um, and so that is now very much understood. And so there's a response of, you know, how can we address that threat and minimize the risks to our operations? And the other is an opportunity. Um, and, you know, Larry Fink, who is the CEO of BlackRock, which is the biggest sort of U.S. Uh, investment firm, you know, I think he's described the climate crisis several times now as, you know, the greatest uh, investment opportunity in history. And so there's kind of two sides of that coin. So a threat to be managed and an opportunity to be seized. And everyone from sort of major energy firms, but also throughout the financial sector is trying to marry those interests. And that comes across in lots of different policy areas. You know, the car uh, carbon pricing is kind of a, a favorite solution of a lot of these firms. Um, as Can is you explain that, uh, what carbon yeah. pricing is? Yeah. Yeah. So carbon pricing kind of does what it says on the tin. So applying a single kind of universal price is the kind of goal to every unit of carbon. So that in theory, it sounds like, you know, if you are a big emitter, then you'll pay more because you're paying per, per unit of carbon. And it's meant to be this kind of very elegant uh, mechanism to internalize carbon emissions to the market uh, so that firms will be motivated to cut that cost by curbing emissions and they'll do so in a way that's efficient and doesn't require, you know, state interventionism uh, to kind of <laughs> get that done. Um, and for, for firms, that's quite a desirable opportunity insofar as it doesn't, you know, require direct regulation in a way that might infringe on their ability to kind of do what they want. <laughs> it's incentives um, versus regulation. Exactly. Yeah. And it has an element in theory of like there being a stick. So not just carrot, you know, some firms can make a lot of money out of it, but also a stick in theory. But I think there's also this tacit kind of understanding um, that carbon pricing broadly can't and won't and has not to date been implemented at a level that could actually make it effective, because the effects of that could be so kind of devastating to the incomes and kind of livelihoods of just average people, uh, that it's broadly, you know, where carbon pricing regimes are in place, the price is at usually far lower than it should be in theory, mm -hmm. according to kind of economic models to actually deliver anything like the kind of pace of decarbonization that we need. So, you know, economists will still say, you know, a carbon price is the ideal solution, but, you know, the actual global carbon price stands at, you know, two, three dollars a ton. And economists would think that, you know, at an absolute minimum, it should be at, you know, forty dollars, some say all the way up to fourteen thousand dollars. So all that to say, we're kind of nowhere near the version of that policy that would really kind of hinder firms interests. And so it's far preferable, I think, to kind of direct regulation that might actually say, you know, you just can't 
pollute or you can't extract right. fossil fuels or, you know, use coal power plants. Well, because the, it also, in, we talk about incentives, it incentivizes them to maybe just do some of these practices in, say, the global south. Right. Exactly. So that is the other trick. Right. So unless you have sort of a global universal carbon price, which, again, is the kind of like far off dream of, of economists, then you do have all these questions around sort of carbon leakage, around kind of offshoring to other places. And you also have in the kind of incentive section, you know, carbon pricing by definition doesn't really care how you cut carbon. And so it might be that, and this is what's happened with the European Union's emissions trading scheme, which is probably the most kind of successful and well-known of these uh, mechanisms, you know, instead of, you know, cutting carbon in a permanent kind of durable way in a way that would actually, you know, bring renewables online or, or other forms of actually zero carbon industry, you've broadly just seen kind of short temporary transitions to from coal to gas or little tweaks to energy efficiency that then kind of leave us flatlining a little bit. Um, and the other is that in order to make this work in a market, it broadly requires an ability to sort of trade these units. And that kind of requires carbon offsets, which are sort of an asset that you can create that says, you know, you can buy the rights to pollute and you can pay me carbon offset provider and I will plant, you know, a thousand trees somewhere. Um, and so that is also, you know, a whole new industry that sprung up that is, you know, hugely successful in kind of selling the idea that you can sort of pay to pollute. How does carbon capture play into this? Because, um, I mean, that also seems to be a favorite of neoliberal econo uh, economists and politicians. Mm. I mean, carbon capture is the ultimate kind of tool for maintaining business as usual, right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, there's a part of me that would, you know, that would love if it worked, but it's probably just not a viable technology <laughs> at scale whatsoever. Um, you know, I think the, the biggest kind of trial of the largest carbon offset project um, re released its results a few months back and it had captured like a third of their kind of low ambition for the project. And it was meant to be the one that would be the big breakthrough. And, and so leaning, I think, on, on carbon capture and storage as heavily as, you know, fossil fuel giants do is absolutely a way to kind of get around uh, needing to actually change their business models whatsoever. But, you know, so is carbon offsetting just as much. You know, airlines absolutely love it. Um, I'm sure anyone who's taken a flight in the past couple of years has been offered the option to pay to offset their, their flight. Um, and so it's absolutely a very convenient mechanism for saying broadly, we don't need to change business models. We don't need to do any of the hard work of decarbonizing. We could just pay a little bit extra. A, you know, profitable new industry springs up, everybody's happy and uh, job is done. <laughs> right. No, we've solved it. Um, <laughs> like, I, I, it's it's so funny, too, because um, it, we've covered segments on Fox News, for example, targeting ESG investing, right? And saying that that is um, this mandate from the Biden administration, which is, of course, so so far <laughs> from the case. But but environmental social uh, governance investing has been like really exploding over the past uh, three, four or five years, uh, I would say. And it's another way to I, I, I get first it, to me it feels like corporate PR but yeah. um I, I I'm curious about your take on like the preponderance of that uh, specifically over the past few years yeah I have been I have to say like obsessed with the whole kind of woke capital backlash that's been unfolding in in the U.S. kind of anti-ESG <laughs> campaign from the right which I find really fascinating because it's a kind of really mask off moment for the right on, you know, this is ostensibly, you know, a free market doing exactly what it's meant to do, which is, you know, corporate actors acting in their own interest. They perceive, you know, ESG as a framework to be in their own interests as a profit seeking corporation. Uh, and, you know, the right is now really angry that the free market is not doing the things it wants it to do. So it's yeah. time to sort of crack down on that, which I find quite fun. Um, to watch unfold. But yeah, ESG, I mean, ESG has been around far longer than Biden. Um, and, you know, broadly is a mechanism for corporates, but most of the financial system to try and kind of do some box ticking to understand how they should kind of allocate capital according to these criteria, so environmental, social and governance criteria, although admittedly, the E in ESG is by far, you know, the, the most kind of relevant most of the time, you know, people kind of 
<laughs> disregard the S and G a lot. Um, but yeah, ESG is kind of this idea that by sort of looking at firms that might comply with certain criteria that, you know, some analysts at a firm establish, that you can sort of mitigate your exposure to the risks associated with, um, you know, climate regulation or with human rights violations in your supply chains, etc. And in doing so, you can sort of maximize your returns by minimizing those risks and you can sort of do well by doing good. Um, and it kind of exploded, um, particularly up to and during the height of the pandemic. So 2020 was like the best year for ESG um, because it seemed like it was coming true that this kind of logic of just reducing your exposure to the bad things um, meant that you could sort of maximize your own returns and broadly have kind of a clean conscience. Um, but the key thing there is that, you know, the vast majority of what happens in ESG is, like you said, kind of corporate PR is part of it, absolutely. But even where firms are actually doing what they say they're doing, which is, you know, eliminating the kind of risky companies from their portfolios, there is a really critical missing step there that is just totally ignored, which is that, you know, cutting out a few fossil fuel companies from your fund does not mean that you're reinvesting any of that capital in sort of the industries that we need to see for the kind of green transition. There's absolutely no kind of linkage there. And so what we've got is, you know, firms that are minimizing their financial risk without doing anything to kind of try to actually drive forward decarbonization, which is, I think, how it's often sort of promoted, right? So if you look at the big ESG funds, you know, I looked other, the other day at Vanguard, which is, again, one of the biggest U.S. Mm -hmm. managers, and it's kind of flagship U.S. ESG fund is broadly just like the S&P 500 with right. like one or two fossil fuel companies removed. So it's, you know, it's top holdings, which are like a fifth of the fund is, you know, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, another tech firm, and, you know, one or two other big techs. And, you know, that is hardly going to be like driving forward the transition to a decarbonized economy. Um, and I think that for me is the critical aspect of ESG. Yeah, uh, it, it, that's an incredibly broad definition of uh, in, of ESG, right? Because it's, it, as you say, it's just the absence of investing in big oil as opposed to uh, the investment in technology or in companies that would push things forward, um, kind of restating what you said there. But mm -hmm. I, um, I'm also curious, too, about what you think of the real push, and this is now from the Inflation Reduction Act um, as well, for electric vehicles to be the uh, the the catch-all climate solution uh, here, as opposed to, say, I don't know, making our transit systems <laughs> run in a way where uh, we, like, people can feasibly use public transit uh, throughout the country. But, I mean, even just regionally um where areas we are where we already have a lot of transit lines they're just not updated or expanded like that is another way to maintain the status quo and not undercut auto manufacturers or anything like that you can still use these credits to uh, manufacture cars but it's not the most sustainable way forward no i think i mean you've touched on it there i think you know Electric vehicles better in many ways than having, you know, uh, a sort of conventional combustion engine on the road, um, but absolutely not without sort of physical impact and cost, right, in terms of the materials that go into particularly the batteries. Um, and there's an academic that, you know, many viewers might know called Thea Rhea Francos, who does sort of brilliant work kind of tracing the impacts of specifically, you know, the lithium mining industry uh, mm. throughout the global south and sort of uh, South America in particular. Um, because it's such a kind of water intensive and environmentally destructive form of mining, it has major impacts on sort of indigenous and, and local communities in uh, Chile and, and neighboring countries. And so there are real concerns to be had about sort of relying on just replacing, you know, the abundance of personal vehicles in the US or anywhere in the world, uh, one to one that is kind of just conveniently sort of sidelined for two reasons, I think, one of which is, you know, the kind of real politic of passing climate politi policy in the US and in many other places, Canada, you know, notwithstanding, is that you need to kind of convince people often that there'll be minimal disruption to the kind of lifestyles that they're maybe accustomed to, rather than trying to 
I think tell people the much more positive story that, you know, your car kind of sucks. Commuting is terrible. Your car probably spends, I think the statistic is like 90% of its lifespan parked for the average vehicle. You know, 50 square kilometers of the city of London where I live are taken up by parking spaces that could be housing or, or green space. You know, all of these terrible things about having a society dominated by individual cars, um, you know, could be turned into a very positive story about how we could totally organize mobility differently and in a way that's just much better for everybody. And, you know, so I think the, the politics of that are probably, in my view, sort of poorly done, but understandable in terms of kind of not wanting to rock the boat. But the other thing is that from the green capitalism perspective, you know, that's broadly necessary, right? So, you know, for it, for the kind of green capitalist approach to policymaking, the idea is that, you know, all of the things that we want to have in a kind of like green, low carbon future uh, can and must be profit making and profitable. And so for for the corporate sector, for investors, you know, having ideally decommodified, but maybe let's just say affordable kind of decarbonized mass public transit, you know, that is a far less appealing prospect than you know, everyone having their sort of vehicles replaced one to one with uh, with EVs. And so that kind of logic, I think, pervades as well. Right. Which is that if we leave this transition to, you know, we kind of abdicate the question of, of planning and strategy and we leave it to the profit motive, then this is the kind of, of kind of result that we'll inevitably see. Right. And and I mean, this is the this is the fatal flaw and it's. <laughs> every it, it, it completely um embedded in every element of the inflation reduction act unfortunately i mean mm. there it is a market based climate bill and that's not to say that it's better than doing nothing of course it is but that you can see someone like joe manchin's fingerprints all over this and and that's what makes it so alien to what we were talking about when Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez introduced the Green New Deal uh, in her freshman year at, or freshman term as, as a member of Congress. That's so uh, there were, of course, market solutions and market incentives in that an initial yeah. proposal. But the more robust uh, kind of um, infrastructure elements, as opposed to tax credits and incentives for private corporations, those were in it included um, as well. And it's it's a real missed opportunity that we had a, a hostage taker in Manchin as the 50th yeah. vote in the Senate, because really, as you lay out so well, this is going to be insufficient, wildly so. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Inflation Reduction Act for me is such an interesting case because in many ways, it was this kind of very marked departure from what had dominated American climate politics you know, for every year prior to the IRA that had, that it had been discussed, right, which was carbon pricing, you know, ever since Waxman Markey, that has always been the fixation and broadly something that's always failed. And so there is this real pivot from sort of pricing and sort of tweaks to the market to, you know, what can be understood broadly as, you know, an industrial strategy with some green bits. <laughs> um, and I think that is a really positive shift in, in that kind of basic sense. But you're absolutely right that that's come with these kind of incredible carve outs for, you know, yes, there's some direct public investment and it's, you know, it's very substantial in many ways, but the most of what's going to happen in terms of investment through this bill will be, you know, subsidy for private sector actors to kind of get their hands on a lot of this infrastructure and a lot of the kind of industries of this kind of green future. And, you know, I think there's a lot of people who say, you know, what's really the problem with that? What we just want is to see, you know, investment flow in and we just want to see these industries built up. And I think, you know, there's a grain of truth to that. I think there's, you know, there's an urgency to what we're facing that means that we have to take, I guess, some compromises. But I think the real danger that I see is that, you know, what we are doing is exactly what I just described, right, which is handing over the question of kind of planning and of ensuring that we kind of do this in a way that is not only, you know, fast enough and at the kind of scale we need to see, but that is also kind of based in sort of justice and not just kind of massively sidelining and harming kind of poorer communities, communities of color, communities in the global south, which is like something that often happens with kind of industrial strategy <laughs> and industrial policy. Um, and, you know, instead we're handing over the reins to private sector motivations and broadly to sort of 
large kind of Titanic investment firms like BlackRock or some of the big private equity firms in an industry that's hugely concentrated. So it's this kind of very undemocratic process, you might say, in terms of, you know, who is really going to be driving forward where capital flows. And that's going to be based in the specific set of interests of kind of a handful of investment firms rather than thinking strategically about what it is that we that we really need. And, you know, accepting that one, you know, not everything that we need for the transition to kind of decarbonize society can be made profitable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, things like care, for example, and uh, other forms of kind of service work that aren't the kind of conventional things that we think of as green, but that are absolutely going to need to be kind of scaled up in the kind of society that we want to see. You know, those are sectors that are never going to be appealing or profitable in the way that, uh, you know, the private sector might want. And the other is that, you know, everything that can be made profitable shouldn't necessarily be, right? So just because it can be profitable doesn't mean that we should, you know, have things be more costly to people because, you know, firms have the incentive to maximize their profit and, and pay out to shareholders. And I think that kind of dual logic is very much present and alive uh, in, in the IRA. But it does have some fun carve outs, you know, like the kind of direct pay question for, for sort of municipal governments and sort of not for profits, which is exciting compared to, again, sort of previous subsidy regimes. But I like to give like a slight silver lining rather than well, just... Well, I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, my last question here, and I'll let you go, but I, I wanted to see if you could expand even more on the point um, about how lithium mining is kind of another reboot of our uh, offsetting of the worst yeah. of the climate catastrophe and capitalism onto the global south. Um, this is what we talk about when we talk about climate injustice and inequity. Mm -hmm. And um, it's important, I think, that like a lot of the youth climate movement is a lot more cognizant of including voices from the global south where this, these effects yeah. are being felt. But lithium mining in particular, because this is going to be a natural resource thing that we're uh, the United States is going to be extractive um, once again in, in uh, Latin America over this. So, uh, explain that to the audience, uh, if you don't mind, Adrian. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, the we often talk about when we think about batteries or some of the industries, you know, people talk about critical minerals, these things that are, um, you know, very destructive forms of mining, but that are in tiny supply. And so lithium, because it is actually a very abundant resource, um, there's no kind of shortage of lithium, has often been kind of sidelined because people assume that, you know, because it's abundant, that that's kind of fine. And a lot of it, to date has come from kind of Australia. Um, but going forward, you know, to meet the projections um, that sort of governments have set for what they would like the uptake of personal kind of electric vehicles to be, the International Energy Agency projects that, you know, we need to, from 2020 levels, that lithium demand will increase by 40 fold, just by 20, 2040. So over a 20 year span, 40 times as much lithium that needs to be mined just to meet the demand for, for electric vehicles. And, you know, that is going to be potentially catastrophic to the regions where most of the kind of unexploited lithium remains, which is broadly kind of the Atacama Desert in South America. And a lot of the time, these are areas that are sort of directly relied upon by indigenous communities. They're also usually incredibly uh, sort of water uh, sort of scarce. So kind of desert areas, salt flats, um, high in the kind of mountains. And lithium itself, you know, is an incredibly water intensive process, one of the forms of extracting it. So you kind of use water shot underground and you kind of get these lithium salts coming through the brine. Um, and it's already having sort of very devastating impacts on communities' abilities to, you know, sustain their own kind of water supplies just to exist, let alone to engage in the kind of agriculture that they would normally, you know, form part of their economy. Um, it's also potentially very destructive to, to biodiversity and to some of the sort of water systems that, that nature relies upon. And so it is absolutely, you know, by neglecting to, you know, I think it's uncomfortable for a lot of people to think about, you know, it's we're so desperate to be like 
please give us any kind of climate solution and any policy that is going to cut emissions and EVs are included in that, that it feels uncomfortable to then admit that there are serious environmental and social justice questions related to that. But I think it absolutely needs to be sort of front and center in the conversation, not least because there are so many ways to avoid it, like we've already touched upon by, you know, thinking about other forms of kind of mass transit and thinking about EVs as kind of like a last resort used for those who absolutely can't get around in other ways. Um, and, you know, embracing other forms of how we could, you know, organize our society and, and resources. Well, uh, thank you so much for coming on today, Adrian Buller, a senior fellow at Commonwealth, author of The Value of a Whale on the Illusions of Green Capitalism. We will uh, put a link to your book in the podcast, YouTube descriptions and all of that. And at majority.fm. Thanks, Adrian. Really appreciate Thanks it. Thanks so much. Bye.